So, Transport in the Time of COVID-19, your 19th of January um, update issue, and this will be the last issue with uh, Rubbish Broadband. Um, uh, and uh, actually, shall I just... Uh, uh, no, I've, you can see that slide, everybody, okay? Yep. Yeah, it's good, Bob. Right, so uh, it, this was due to be one with all singing, all dancing animations, but uh, talk, talk are complete bastards. And when they say it's due to be in on the 19th, they mean within two hours of midnight on the 19th. So anyway, that's just my little thing. So uh, usual uh, email address for people to send me information. A lot of people are doing that. If you want the slides immediately, uh, also go to chairrdrf at aol.com. The theme for today is how long have we got? Okay. So first tweet is from Stephen Colbert, who's a, a kind of comedian guy on US telly. And if you go to that tweet, you'll see uh, information about the 56 inch monster screen display uh, on a Mercedes Benz. Uh, so you can look at that instead of looking at the road. And really, the road safety industry don't seem to have got their heads around dealing with that kind of stuff. Um, Right, now a lot of uh, updates and things to look at here. Uh, Police and Crime Commissioner elections, it's a link there for you to go to. Don't forget our webinar run by Action Vision Zero and Road Peace with me and others contributing on the 21st at five o'clock. Um, that's about the Police and Crime Commissioner elections and making road danger something which we want them to get uh, their heads around. Another uh, uh, webinar there from Croydon Living Streets. Uh, last week I mentioned the national lockdown guidance and uh, raised issues about what it means for cycling. Cycling UK has called for clarity on the English exercise rules. Uh, after Johnson was seen going for seven miles on a bicycle, which is supposed to be a very bad thing. Um, but uh, so they're calling for clarity. Do take a look at that. I mentioned last week the School Streets report by Mums for Lungs. Um, just out is a briefing on LTNs, um, which has been done by the possible people. And they do have an interesting uh, quote there. I think I got that from Simon Still. Across London, people in the most deprived quarter of neighbourhoods are three times more likely to live in a new LTN. So, you know, the idea that LTNs are just for rich people is not true. Uh, British Cycling have uh, talked about a supposed explosion in cycling's popularity amongst children in the lockdown. Take a look at that. And this piece by Mark Philpotts on advertising boards on the footway. Right, very nice little piece by London's happiest bus driver. Um, he's a guy who says that LTNs and cycle lanes are a very good thing. So do take a look at his little piece there. Uh, the International Environmental, uh, what's the name, Association, whatever they are, Carbon emissions fell across all sectors in 2020, apart from one, which is SUVs. SUVs are bad, more data there. Uh, the ACT Travelwise Annual Conference is on the 26th, 28th January. Go to that link. Um, nice little publication by CPRE and others about healthy and sustainable planning, which uh, Cycling UK has been part of. Uh, take a look at that, it's very important. Uh, I've mentioned Mums for Lungs had a petition up uh, asking the what used to be called the Freight Transport Association is now called Logistics UK, um, asking them why are you so proud of delaying uh, clean air zones, uh, equivalent of low emissions zones throughout uh, England. Um, and getting through to Sainsbury's and Asda and Waitrose saying 
if you're going to be members of this association, please stop them lobbying to delay clean air. So there's a, a, a petition there, 65,000 signatories already. Uh, on the 26th of January, we've got land or cycling and walking innovations. Uh, go to that link there, a lot of the usual great and good speaking. Um, now, Foundation for Integrated Transport, which is a very good body with some money, they are calling for proposals for funding for campaigns against car dominance. So if you want to get some money in for your organization to do some work on a campaign against car dominance and you think you need funding, go to them on that link. And I'd like to see that money going to uh, some nicely committed people because I know there are a lot of you out there. It's a petition to make Battersea Bridge in London safe to cross. Uh, actually, it's addressed to TfL, and there's an issue about it also belonging to uh, the, the junction concerned at the north end belonging to Kensington and Chelsea. Um, and at the bottom there, you can see a website designing the cyclingcity.com, which looks pretty flash. Uh, Max Glaskin sent it to me. Um, is it a good course? It looks interesting. I'd like those of you who run courses like Phil Jones and Brian and others to take a look at it and see whether you think it's a good online course. Uh, oh yeah, uh, here was a nice tweet. David Blunkett, the former Home Secretary, people complaining about uh, Johnson doing seven miles on a bike. And he said, people on their bikes should be left alone. That's at 28 seconds. Take a look at that. And here's the uh, Ms. Ms. Patel saying something similar uh, in the way that only she can. Exercise is important. It's important for people's health and well-being. And that equally applies to exercise. Thank you. Uh, nothing new on the diversity uh, page that I've come across this week. The delay slide is now the what's happening slide. When is active travel England going to get going? Now, the other thing I've been going on about on this slide is part six of the Road Traffic Act 2004. And this week, there's been a lot of flurry following an article in the Times saying that it looks like it's going to happen soon. However, if you look at the latest comments, it's what they actually say is Department for Transport officials are working up uh, legislation. That doesn't actually mean anything. And the last thing we heard was that it would take several months to bring into force. So I think people like Mark and all party parliamentary cycling and walking group have been looking into that. And uh, while something did go in the Times, uh, maybe it's nothing new. I don't know. Um, I'd like to hear from other people to see whether it is going ahead now or not, um, if there is anything new. Right, this is on the ground in the UK. Cambridgeshire. Oh, no, 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 no. Um, they have got approval from this sign, which means in the bus lane, you're going to have motorcyclists, which I'm not wild about, taxis, which they weren't originally supposed to be for, bicycles, yeah, that's good, but not electric vehicles as well. That kind of misses the point about what uh, dealing with congestion is all about. Um, Cambridge Cycling Campaign are taking this up and do get involved with them or whatever, because th th this is really ludicrous. I mean, people have been trying to do this for ages and so-called high occupation vehicles and so on. But frankly, buses and bicycles is what they're for. Um, maybe taxis. And, you know, we really don't want uh, electric cars in there. Greater Manchester, Bolton, right, okay, this is something I think was put in with active travel funding, 
for bicycles, and you can see there are private motor vehicles in it. Bolton Council say there is no intention to enforce at this time. However, cars parked on cycle lanes pose problems for cyclists, and it forces them onto the flow of traffic. We would encourage all motorists to consider cyclists and their safety and ensure they park appropriately. Well, you know, uh, that doesn't seem to be happening. And elsewhere, there's news about a Cyclops junction in Bolton. And frankly, um, what is the point of getting money to put in some good stuff and then do bad stuff elsewhere, whether or not it is on something which was also funded through the Active Travel Fund? So, you know, that is something that would be good to get Chris Boardman and Transport for Greater Manchester onto because it, it does make a mockery of the whole thing. Right, uh, Levens Hume Low Traffic Neighbourhood in Greater Manchester. Um, I uh, have mentioned them before and Greater Manchester Police Traffic Twitter say his vehicle failed to stop for us. Very brief pursuit was brought to a safe conclusion thanks to these planters, which have recently been placed in the roads around Levensview. Yeah. So there's the, you know, everybody says, oh, you know, low traffic neighborhoods obstructing police. Here's one for your files saying how good LTNs can be for the emergency services. Bournemouth uh, is something from Andy Hadley. Uh, they're revoking Keol Bridge to privileged car access. This is what it was with active travel funding. That's what it will be. Um, Liverpool, West Derby Road. I think I had a, a picture of the uh, pop-up cycle lanes when I went in. Um, is recording about 260 cyclists per day. That doesn't seem an enormous amount, but apparently it's a very busy dual carriageway. So the pop-up cycle has helped with that. Right, now in London, here's a poll uh, by Redfield and Wilton with 1,500 people surveyed, and you get these from it, but do go to the, the full poll. 63% of people living in a low traffic neighborhood say it's improved their lives against 14% who says it hasn't. 50% of Londoners have cycled more in the pandemic. 47% of Londoners not living in LTNs think it would improve their lives as against 14% who don't. So that's broadly speaking, good news. In Brent, there's a pause on rollout of schemes. I think this is because of a request by London Ambulance Service under a lot of pressure. And I think there's also been the reports of vandalism of planters. Um, in Camden, there's a legal challenge to the Haverstock Hill cycle lanes. And that the council has got a fairly weak proposal for Kilburn High Road with cycle lanes, which is actually fairly low key for what we would like to expect from Camden. Um, the playing out uh, Twitter people have said one council is actively supporting children to play outside safety during lockdown a genuine lifeline for families. Well done, Waltham Forest Council. And in Tower Hamlets, one of the pro-LTN councillors says our local LTN bunch are currently claiming that recent events in America remind them of our administration. Uh, you know, the wild analogies uh, section. Uh, also in London, there's a parklet work in progress. Um, my colleague Brenda Pesh pointed out that uh, some councils are pretty good and not very pro parklets because they don't get revenue from the parking space which is taken away and there's a lot of admin and stuff like that. I don't know about that. Ah, here's Ealing. I worked for Ealing for years. And Ealing Broadway is, there are problems for secure cycle parking and some seems to be put in, uh, in, the, in or near the Ealing Broadway Centre. Right, now this is an important graph from Waltham Forest. I showed you uh, this a graphic similar to this last week, which was just the weekday um, counts showing an increase in 2020. Uh, and that was very important because most of the increase that is quite definite and lasting has been over the weekends. 
uh, Waltham Forest were showing last week that on weekdays they were up on previous years. And so this is Waltham Forest with the, the Mini Holland. Uh, the black column, that is all days. And as you can see, that goes up. So it's both weekdays and weekends, uh, pretty clear increase. Right now, Kensington and Chelsea. Um, we had a long discussion about that last week. Here's something from Better Streets for RBKC. And uh, we talked about whether they, the, the council was taking action in order to avoid a judicial review. It does appear that the uh, pre-action letter has been sent by the Environmental Law Foundation on the behalf of RB Better Streets for RBKC, and that they are pursuing the uh, preliminary grounds of the, the JR. And if you want to read your way through all that and look at the links, uh, please email me immediately after the session. I'll send you this uh, uh, on the slides. But that, that's my take from it. Um, and that's it. Uh, I haven't yet sorted out lots of um, things to read at the end and no funny cartoons or anything else. I hope that's okay. Cheers, Bob. That, that was great. Has anybody got any points of order for Bob? Oh, seemed pretty good, didn't that? Nobody asked me about Bolton, please. Uh, I can see a hand there. Steve, is that your hand up? No. Oh, I can see Mark's hand. Oh, yeah, I'll put it on the other view. There you go. I'm getting clever now. Then I can see hands go up. Uh, go on, Mark, did you have a question? What point? I thought Simon had something to say, but first, Simon Monk. I don't know if he said something in the chat. I don't know if you wanted to mention that about London. Yeah, just... Uh... I can do. Uh, for those for those who can't read the chat or aren't reading the chat, uh, we're starting to see a couple of boroughs announce round two funding schemes. Uh, so Enfield has announced, uh, which I'm very excited about, the Brownlow, uh, Busgate, uh, other other boroughs are moving forward with schemes. So we think that TfL are still assessing uh, borough capacity. Um, I was told that, for instance, one of the boroughs put in a bid for 33 low traffic neighbourhoods, having never done a low traffic neighbourhood before. So TfL have had to kind of go, hold your horses on that one a little bit. Um, so uh, so there is a, a process going on, but boroughs are starting to announce their next chunks of schemes. Sorry, uh, uh, Simon, that's um, to be in implemented or have they already gone through consultation? What stage are they in those? those... It's, all, it's all a mix. And I think, I think certainly for London, I don't know about the rest of the country, but the vibe is that we're going to increasingly not see this wait six months, have a big blitz of announcements, then wait six months, have a big blitz of announcements. It's more going back to a bit of a business as usual of schemes trickling out whenever they're kind of ready to go. Um, and I think, you know, what I'm certainly being told by London folks is, is essentially there's a, there's a mix, TfL are assessing a mix of borough capacity and what schemes are ready, good, ready to go, et cetera. So some boroughs will have like five schemes ready to go right now. They'll be, they'll be out the door straight away. Other boroughs will fall to bat for ages on one scheme before they then, you know, get, get around to doing it. And then, you know, the borough with the five schemes will have come back already for a second by, you know, by the time the other boroughs even got out the starting block. So I think it's going to be much more mixed from now on. Um, but these schemes are a mix of ones that are going into detailed design, ones that are yet to be engaged on and other ones as well that are ready to go. So just two, two updates from the South Coast. So one is interesting developments in Shoreham where the local MP Tim Loughton is convening a round table between the, the pros and antis um, of what's that, what's going to happen. And that comes out directly from Grant Shapp's message to involve MPs in the discussion of future routes, which is a sort of constitutional change, really, because MPs have got no legal jurisdiction over local authority stuff at all. But as I said, Grant Shapp's letter explicitly says MPs should be asked for their opinions. And here we've got an MP who I think wants it to happen sticking his nose in where it's being taken out so which is a good thing did you want to see i see to the member uh, to the honorable member from lcc <laughs> so we, we've had numerous chats about mps in london yeah as as 
you know, as has just been said by Mark, um, they don't have any formal kind of powers in all this, um, but that doesn't stop them from sticking their blooming oar in like crazy when they want to. Um, and quite often having not been briefed by their own council, by their policy officers, by whoever. So, um, so we've had some quite uh, problematic uh, MP issues in London. Uh, anyone who's following Ealing, for instance, will know well about that one. Um, but there are numerous other ones going on behind the scenes. So, so we have certainly are moving to a point and we're asking our borough groups to move to a point where when new schemes start kind of developing, um, they talk to the MPs and start emailing MPs and things like that, as well as traditionally we'd have said to our borough groups that just get, you know, get members to email the the lead member the you know yeah. the cabinet leader or whatever MPs are now very much on the list and I think it's right to do that in terms of otherwise MPs tend to go off brief all over the place. Well, I bumped into my local MP Lloyd Russell Moyle, who was the one who asked the question, parliamentary question about um, moving traffic fence cameras, and discussed this with him. And he said, "Actually, I've always been in favour of MPs having a standing right to attend any council meeting without invitation and speak on any issue." Um, he said that is my position, not a Labour Party position. But uh, so there are at least some MPs who think they should be like super councillors. So it's not unusual. Anyway, that's one thing. And um, uh, the other thing is that Brighton, literally now the Environment Committee at Brighton is meeting to discuss um, lots of things. But the two things of relevance are um, a car free city centre or as they're renaming it, a livable city centre because they're putting out it's going to be 99% car free rather than 100%. Um, but also a charging ULES for the, um, with the, and the recommendation is to take that for the whole city with a boundary on the outskirts of the city. So sort of following the London model. There'll be many years before it actually happens, but it'll be very interesting to see if, well, hopefully that gets through and to see if that leads to action. Very nice. I'm moving to yeah. the staff house then. Um, Dave, <laughs> you want to come in? Yeah, quick one, for, mainly for Ruth, but also in Rolf's Patch in London. Uh, I see the note that Hounslow is probably going to be the first borough in London to get a workplace parking levy. Now, that should provide some leverage to improve cycling. Any thoughts? Uh, um, well, where, where, did, where did you find that out about Hounslow? Um, it was probably in either LTT or something along those lines, you know, one of these through a transport circulating lists. Yeah. Yeah, I think Ruth knows about it. Ruth, do you want to come in? Uh, yeah, I was on a webinar this morning. So Mark Frost, who was our assistant head of transport, who's now left to set up a consultancy, is doing a land or links thing about it on the 21st, I think it is. Um, and yes, they put it out to consultation and it seems to be going down very well. And cycling is one of the things that this council does seem to be using as the main plank for their environmental green strategy. Thing. So it's all looking very positive from where I'm sitting. Very exciting, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Exciting there. All right, I think uh, I can't see any more. Oh, sorry, I will just say it's only for new businesses only, sadly, though. It isn't like, oh, every workplace can now, uh, will now have to do a workplace levy. It's for the new things that are on stream, as far as I can understand it, sadly. I'll right, dip in one. Okay. Um, okay, we'll go to our first uh, proper speaker then. Um, Charles, are you there? Give me a bit of an introduction about bike car. Charles Carey. There we go. Hi. Can you see that, everyone? Yeah, you're all good. Great stuff. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I would just like to take the opportunity to share with you um, a version of bike share, which I've termed integrated transport bike share. Um, this is really only, th this model of bike share is really only demonstrated in the Netherlands. Uh, and you might think, oh, well, the Netherlands, um, that's always a different case. Well, actually, I think this, this, this model of bike share could easily be replicated across Europe without needing the infrastructure um, associated with the Netherlands. Um, so let's, I'll just take you briefly through what it is. Um, can you see that everyone? Is that clear? Yeah. Yeah. So um, this is the Netherlands. The top photograph is Delft Railway Station. It's a split level station. Um, the stations on the top right 
with the buses outside and uh, on the level below it, on the right behind the striped obscure frosted glazing is the typical massive cycle park which you find in many Dutch stations. Um, if you look over to the left on that similar level, you will see through the glass uh, a, a bunch of blue and yellow bikes all stacked together. And they are part of this uh, Ovi Feets integrated bike share run by the Dutch railway company. Uh, if you look at the photograph uh, below on the left, uh, that's Utrecht station. Um, as you may know, it's the largest bike park uh, in the world. Uh, and these, these yellow and blue bikes are just the ones used for integrated transport bike share. The way the system works is none of those bikes are locked up. They're in a secure compound overseen by personnel. And you go up and pick a bike and the photograph to the right shows that you go past somebody who will uh, pair your travel card because obviously they, they have an integrated train travel card and they pair that card to the key for the lock, which is shown in the small photograph on the right. Uh, and that way, that, that's how that bike is attached to yourself. Now, the key thing about this model is that you've got the bike for the day and you bring it back to the station because this is about integrating the bicycle to the last mile of your, your other journey, whether it's by, well, in, in the case of the Netherlands, it's just by train. Um, but the concept could be extended to other public transport modes like metro and buses. Um, however, the Dutch haven't done it all right. They, these, the, this model works fine for large railway stations where um, you can justify personnel to, to log out the bike to each user. Um, when it comes to the smaller stations, um, they, they really haven't solved the problem. The, these very expensive lockers is, is, is one of their versions. And this is partly the reason why the model hasn't extended to the Dutch tram networks in The Hague and Rotterdam and Amsterdam and Utrecht. Um, so it, it, it really, does uh, beg the question to extend this model to a cheaper alternative automated system, which was what we set up our company. We, we developed this system at Stack Rack Bicycles in Britain. We developed this rail to ride um, bike share model, which was really trying to copy the OB Feats model in the Netherlands uh, and make it more automated so it could be applied to smaller stations. Um, the system comprises uh, a docking station on the left, you can see a, 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 um, that black uh, two meter rack holds six bicycles in, in a stack formation. Uh, the bikes can be released either with a contactless card or an app and the two photographs to the right are just screenshots of the app. Uh, we, we developed this app um, to be as simple to the user as possible, uh, you just unlock the bike and lock it. Uh, this was a trial done with West Midland trains in, in, in Worcester. Um, and the key thing we thought uh, was that if you are gonna integrate bicycles to, to, to your other journey, uh, you really need the ability to pre-book it. So we, we've got this pre-booking system on the right there where you could book up to 10 days in advance, which meant that you could buy a weekly season ticket for the train journey, knowing that you would have a bike available. Uh, obviously, uh, there's only six bikes there. The, the, there was provision to make a, a, another rack on the other station for 12, and, and, and the system's modular. You can go 6, 12, 18. Anyway, that was just our attempt to develop a system uh, which was trialed in Worcester successfully. Um, what I really want to explain is why, why we can't consider this model um, across other parts of Britain. Uh, this picture here is, uh, is Manchester, the, the Greater Manchester area, the light grey areas um, are the urban areas, and the heavy dark lines is the Manchester Metro, uh, without the new extension out to Trafford. Um, if, if we were to postulate somebody living on the green dot there uh, between Altrincham and Withenshaw and if they were working at the red dot sort of north of Eccles and Salford Keys uh, they probably would drive um, for the reason that the 
both distances to and from the metro uh, are, are really too far to walk. Uh, you could say that the person living on the green dot could cycle to Altrincham or wh wherever on the metro, leave their bike safely locked, but they couldn't take the bike on the metro. So when they got off at their destination journey, that, that distance is really too far to walk. So they're, they're, they are just going to drive. Uh, if we could integrate bicycles um, to the system, we, we, we vastly increase the access and egress of the metro system across Manchester. Um, and we, we, we could have a, a, a very uh, targeted bike share system for modal shift working in conjunction with the Manchester Metro. Um, I fear Manchester are tendering for a bike share and so in these two diagrams, the one on the left is probably what we will get, uh, whether it's a docking system or a docking less system. I suspect uh, TFGM will be uh, looking at the sort of central part of Manchester and whether they want 1000 or 2000 or have, however many, many bicycles they're tendering for, we will, we will have this added bike share layer, just like traditional bike share, which really won't be focused on modal shift. It'll be a good thing. It'll be another option for transport. Uh, but I, I don't think it'll be uh, that well targeted at decongestion on the cars. And of course, what we could get for the same money is, is on the right hand, where we would have uh, a bike share system r rigidly linked to the metro network. Of course, you could attach it to the train network as well. I'm just demonstrating the metro. Um, and you could have uh, 10, 20, 30 bikes, depending on what, what the station was, um, scattered right across the Greater, greater Manchester region. Um, this does, that doesn't just apply to Manchester. You could probably pick just about any reasonable size town or city in Britain. Uh, on the left is Telford, on the right is Kidderminster. Um, just demonstrating the, the railway station at Telford there and the red stars. Are, are really just industrial industrial parks, which are probably too far to walk, but ideal cycling distance. Uh, at a similar picture, uh, Kidderminster on the right. So, as I say, you could I, I think you could pick any just about any town of reasonable size in Britain and apply this bike share model. I just want to finish on this last important aspect of integrated bike share. Um, and that's the income costs. And this is a very important point because a lot of bike share schemes, when applied, when they move out of the big cities like London and Paris and so on, they tend to wither on the vine. Uh, and if they don't wither on the vine, they, they, they survive with quite a bit of subsidy from the local authority. Um, so if we look on the left, uh, the left hand column is the income. And typically uh, it's split between the red city subsidy which has to be ongoing if you want a, if you want a, a, a bike share scheme to last. Uh, sponsorship, uh, which some cities manage and others don't. So Liverpool didn't manage it in their bike share scheme of 600 bikes. Uh, obviously, London did. Uh, and ticket revenue, which is what the user pays for. And the cost of that, the, the income of that covers the typical costs of a bike share scheme split between the green sort of theft uh, uh, damage to bikes, the orange maintenance of the uh, docking stations and bicycles, and a very large component called redistribution, which is the blue pit. And that applies to both docking station-based systems and dockingless. Uh, Manchester found, obviously, the Manchester experience with the dockingless system, uh, there was a high amount, amount of damage and theft, but they had nothing like the density of bikes that you find in, in Chinese cities, which meant that people still had to be uh, regrouping the bikes uh, in, in, into the appropriate central areas of Manchester. And so that's a typical traditional bike share cost, uh, income cost uh, um, model. On the right in the integrated system, the, uh, the key point is the distribution goes down to zero because the whole model is based uh, most bike share schemes try to get as much use of a bicycle as possible per day. So Barcelona, Dublin, Helsinki are all cities sort of clocking over eight trips per bike per day. And, and they're considered good bike share systems. 
Well, on the right, in the integrated one, you're only getting two trips a day. It belongs to the user uh, and it's part of their regular journey. And, and therefore, um, there's no distribution cost. The bike comes back to where you took it from, your, your, your transport node, whether it's a metro or train station or whatever. And for that reason, maintenance costs also reduced. And because of the, the, the model, it's generally between, the bikes aren't just distributed across huge swathes of urban, urban environments. Uh, similarly, the theft goes down. And these are really significant reductions. And they're so significant that you, you can really postulate that a local authority um, would, could in work, a transport company working with an employer could cover the operational costs, making it zero cost to the user, certainly the regular user. Uh, and that way you would encourage somebody out of a car and they just have to consider the cost of their, their metro train or public transport ticket. And the bike is seen as an integral, sustainable part of it. So that, that's, that's the model. Um, it's a targeted modal shift of bike share. Uh, it doesn't really apply to cities like central London and Paris. This is really for anywhere outside of those areas which already have layers of alternatives to cars and the bike share is just an added layer, a good thing, but an added layer. It doesn't really make a little shift. Um, you have strong financial sustainability. Um, and I suppose my biggest question is, why is it ignored by the local authorities? They, they just don't seem to get it. Uh, and I sort of open, open the floor to reasons that I might be missing um, as to why this isn't used more often. Thank you. Thanks for that, Charles. I, I just knew uh, Mark was going to be the first one in, but I'll just ask a quick question in there. Just the, just with the example you gave, doesn't that rely on you having two bikes, one at either end of the line to do it? And how does that factor in? Uh, well, OK, just going back to the, the little diagram of Manchester there, the, uh, the first mile would generally be your personal bike. So in the Netherlands, uh, many people have two bikes. They will cycle to their, their station. They will leave the bicycle. Uh, they can't, you can't take them on the trains in the Netherlands, so they will actually leave their second bike at their destination station. Uh, in the case of um, uh, th this model, you don't, you don't need to leave your second bike, so you do, you do need your first bike for the first leg, or, or you walk, or whatever, whatever your mode is. Okay, yeah, so it's saying that people are, okay, I've got Mark, and then I saw Bob wave in front well, of Well, I'm going to try to be not cynical and um, uh, grumpy but I, I'm literally literally on the other screen editing my report for a, a certain small town in Hertfordshire that's well known for its very unused um, dedicated cycle tracks um, on bike share and I think one of the reasons that they do not look at it is that is that the current um, round of bike share schemes are very much um, pay for themselves capital costs they don't but they're, they're, they're revenue neutral or they make a profit. So I think the, the old model of the ones that failed that, that, that needed lots and lots of permanent subsidy, they don't, they, need, they do need capital investment at the start. And of course, so would this scheme, it needs a, a scheme, investment to buy the bikes. But the reason I think that, that, that it's, I think everything's got to be looked at the particular location, but every, it, local authorities want to look at bike share is that they are precisely more about attracting people for, for, who don't ride a bike. If you look at the schemes that, that have been there, that have been put in, they attract people who don't consider themselves to be cyclists. The, the bikes are designed to attract um, different sorts of users. Um, and this is much more like, as you say, the blue bike scheme or the, in Belgium or the Ove Feet scheme. And it's very much for people who are cyclists who just don't, who consider themselves to be cyclists, who don't have their bike with them. So actually, I, I disagree. I think this doesn't lead to modal shift or it doesn't lead to individuals turning to bikes. It leads to people who already cycle using a bike for a journey where they might use public transport, which isn't necessarily a bad thing in any way, but it's a very different sort of thing. It's not the sort of thing that gets people who don't currently cycle on at well, all. Mark, I, I, re I really could this may not in you, but I, I, I totally don't follow your logic there. Uh, I, I disagree entirely, 100% with what you're saying. You know, bike share schemes, you know, if we're looking to, to, to decongest, we're looking for practical alternatives and, and this is a system you, people will drive from A to B if the public transport network doesn't 
d d fails and doesn't tr truly link their A to B journey. And this addresses it. And this has nothing to do with whether you're a, a I mean, we're, we're not talking about encouraging cyclists. But people won't they, use, I, I don't want to turn this into an into a, uh, into a one to one discussion. So feel free to try to, to kick me off and oh, get anyone else. The sort, of, the sort of people who use it are that, you know, it, 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 I can't see that this would attract people out of a car. Uh, there are other ways of doing it. For example, the, the, what they did in Birmingham, which is essentially giving away bikes. And, and because if you've got a one-to-one -one bike that you use for a journey backwards and forwards, that is your bike. You might not own the bike, but it is your sole use of the bike. And therefore giving you the sort of week, a weekly hire, which, you know, so maybe you only hire it Monday to Friday, or you actually own and loan the bike. And I think I can't remember, is it Bike Buzz that's doing that sort of scheme? is a very similar way to doing this because two journeys a day is only the person who's using the bike using the bike and whereas about bike show you talk about barcelona five ten times a day the bike gets used by different people but they're all i mean they're all good things they're all but they all feel, they fulfill different different sectors of the market and different needs and you need all of them i don't think that i don't certainly don't think it's an either or Need all of them. Make that point on, Charles. I'll go to Dave to ask a question because we've got another speaker. Um, Dave, go on. Yeah, quick, quickly. I've only been doing this since 1996 when I did the uh, Portsmouth Automated Bike Hire, which wasn't too successful because there was a free minibus over between the same two points. Um, but um, what Charles is showing is very much the same system that Clear Channel put in in Barca and uh, oi bike was actually using along with our bike um, from about 2004 onwards um, the oi bike system used a home port um, packaged delivery system where you hooked a cable through a, a box when somebody was delivering your groceries so that you could be out of the house and then come back and unhook the cable with a code so they were basically using a parcels delivery system to hire bikes um, the thing about public transport and bikes is, as with the fact that you have trains that are 200% full coming into London and 20% full going out at the peak hour, pre-COVID, um, you end up with the reason we told people not to put um, London bike hire at Waterloo Station. Um, basically, you know, you have 500 bikes go out of Waterloo, which have to be found and stored somewhere because you, you can only put in 124 hire points. Um, and the same goes on at King's Cross. So you end up with a very replenishment. It doesn't fit the flow pattern. Um, um, just, just on uh, that, if you look at my website in the presentation, you'll see a paper you can download or on, on the London bike share behavior, which touches just on those two stations. And, and it, it, it did. The, the distribution of bikes in London the, the, is, is an interesting topic in itself. Um, have a look at the paper. It's been written a few years ago. Uh, and, okay. and the other bike hire system... Oh, okay. is, be quick, be quick, because we've got another big okay. session. The other bike hire system that is going is folding bike hire. Um, the Brompton hire is quite efficient because you have 20 bikes on hire from a footprint of only 1.6 square metres at King's Cross. Now, that would be 48 square metres of bike parking otherwise. Um, and they go on the trains and go around the place. So people tend to hire those for four or five days at a time to go and commute to work. So there, there are different models. And as I say, it's very interesting to see the different ways they focus and how you manage them. All right. Yeah, that was more of a comment, wasn't it? I'll, uh, I'll bring... Um, did Richard, did you want to come in? Just to get a different voice. I'll go with Ruth. I'll go on. Go on, Richard. Well, you, if you're short of time, I, I'm just not clear how this works for, for lots of interborough journeys. I'm from a local authority uh, that don't involve train stations. So, you know, we're looking at how we can get those people access to bikes, going to town centres and that kind of thing. It feels like you'd have to have two schemes running almost. I don't really well, get it. Well, I mean, well just, just on that, uh, if you, again, if you look at the website on the link, where, as and when you, you, you upload it, Brian, um, I have added a page for COVID because there's, this model was aimed at uh, buses. I was trying to drive the capital cost down so that you could even have five, five bikes at a bus stop and use this automated system. Um, the point is people aren't using public transport so much, they've reverted back to their cars. 
So the way you would transpose this model is to a park and bike model as opposed to a park and ride in a bus. Uh, and then you're faced with the challenge of finding distributed car parking spots on the edge of urban areas. Um, but again, try not to think about London because London is really a case apart. We, we need to think about the rest of Britain. Tricky for Richard not to think about London there, but I'll, I'm, I'm gonna allow one more person and um, we can go back to this at the end. So the people that wanted to speak, I'm not gonna let you. Uh, Luke, uh, do you wanna come in and ask a question in there? Sorry, Ruth and Bob. You can come in at the end. It's just we've got a full session today. So uh, be... Yeah, I, I just want. I'm to... a woman. I know. <laughs> uh, I, I, well, I just wanted to uh, to make a quick comment because so the the Dutch bikes so they're owned and operated by the Dutch National Railway Services. The Dutch National Railway Services always also have like a separate company that does some of the railway lines in the UK Abellio. So I think they're doing London to Stansted and like London to Norwich or something. Uh, just a few lines. But actually that daughter company also implemented uh, the same type of bike hire in their rural and uh, like non-London stations. So there's actually a few like very tiny stations between London and Stansted Airport where you can actually rent bikes like you can be in the Netherlands. Those are not very successful. I think like I've, the story that I remember is that a Dutch manager from the National Railway Services came to Abellio in the UK to kind of bring in some new ideas. Yes, yes. It's one of his new ideas. And I think it's just like in general, it would be interesting to look at why that model failed. And I think one of the big things that you're going to find is it's great that there's more availability of bikes, but if the local towns just don't have good enough cycle infrastructure, then yeah, people just don't want to really mm. use the bikes in the first place. Just to comment on that, you're absolutely right. A barely introduced bike and go system. It's an offshoot of uh, uh, the NS, the National Spoorwagen in, in the Netherlands. It was a complete failure because of its actual, uh, the way the whole system was executed. So they closed down bike and go. It was on Northwest Rail, Greater Anglia and a number of the Belio franchises. Uh, the, uh, the, indeed, Abellio was my strategy to grow this in this country uh, with the new UK approach to rail franchises. That's all in the bin. Just returning to the Netherlands, the, the, the tram companies of Rotterdam and, and The Hague and so on, which are not owned by NS, don't have a solution to expand the NS system, which is exactly why we developed this technology. All right, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop this topic there, but it's made me think that we need to do bike hire again. <laughs> there's clearly there's a, a lot that people want to say about this, and the, I'll definitely I'll speak to Mark Thank maybe about doing a special session. But well, thanks for that, Charles. We gave you a tough time, but everybody's into this uh, topic. Oh no, no, it's lovely. Thank you. You're yeah, all wrong. <laughs> you have some real experts commenting there as well. So I'll move over to Graham and um, and Shan. You're going to come in now, or can you stop sharing the screen, Charles, if possible? Graham, our man in Bolton, are you here? Yep, we're uh, ready to go. Okay, um, yeah, we. Um, it's really three, three of us who are uh, the, probably some of the more active members of the of our active travel forum in Bolton. Um, really got interested in in looking at, um, at some of the things that already exist in Bolton that uh, we don't generally tend to think about. Um, myself, Graham Cooper, I'm just a retired troublemaker in Bolton. I run the Active Travel Forum. Mike Hutton uh, lives in West Horton and he, he's done quite a bit of work in West Horton. He, he helped us with that, uh, that side of things out on the, the far west of the borough. Uh, and Shan Wilkinson is, um, is, the, is the professional among us. She actually uh, works in public health but um, is uh, doing this in her spare time. So I just want to start by uh, putting up a quotation. The freedom with which a person can walk about and look around is a very useful guide to the civilized quality of an urban area. Judged against this standard, many of our towns now seem to leave a great deal to be desired. There must be areas of good environment where people can work, shop, look about and move around on foot in a reasonable freedom from the hazards of motor traffic. So that's very relevant for, uh, for today. I'm not going to say where that came from. I'll, I'll 
come back to them at the end. So I think you're all familiar about with the um, with the the debate you might call it I should put that in inverted commas on low traffic neighbourhoods or, or filtered neighbourhoods or as we like to call them around here active neighbourhoods. Um, they tend to be residential streets or areas with residential streets where there's a lot of rat running and you're trying to eliminate motor traffic by uh, by uh, through traffic rather by uh, putting in some kind of barrier that makes it permeable to walking and cycling but not to motor vehicles. And they seem to be causing a lot of strong feelings. We've got a, a consultation just started here about a small um, active neighbourhood that, uh, that is hopefully going to go ahead. And already there's backlash and people threatening to vandalise whatever is put in place and stuff like that. Not much, but, uh, but it's only just gone up. Um, so the sorts of things, um, sorts of objections we see are things to do with uh, the unfairness of pushing traffic from some roads onto other roads, particularly at the boundary of the, um, of the low traffic neighborhood. Um, problems that are uh, asserted with gentrification, you make an area nice, the property prices go up and the locals get pushed out. There are some issues with that, as we'll see uh, later in the talk. Um, emergency services, deliveries, disabled access, and all of that sort of thing, which tends to be, uh, be mostly not true, actually. You talk to the emergency services, and they're perfectly happy with, uh, with most of these schemes. And then the one that often comes up, we are not Wealth and Forest. This is Bolton. We're different. We're unique in all the world. And you do see that everywhere you see that. And so the result is you get vandalism. Um, and the, uh, the picture on the right is actually from a video that somebody posted of themselves pushing a planter out of the way with their car. Um, so hopefully that was passed on to the police and, uh, and some action was taken. But the good thing about that is that you also see that that sort of vandalism sort of makes the, um, the, the silent majority start to take notice of what's going on. And here we've got those same planters that have been reinstated by... Uh, by people who live in the area. So there's all this, it's almost, in certain places, it's almost like a war over this new fangled thing called a, a low traffic neighborhood. But we sort of asked the question, are they really new? And this sort of came up for me um, earlier in the year when, um, when I was walking with my wife in uh, Halliwell, part of Bolton. And I noticed some continuous footways. And I'd actually seen some of those continuous footways on another road in the same, area as I, I used to cycle past um, and I, I, it sort of reminded me that Shan had mentioned some time ago that she thought she'd found an active neighborhood and I'd put that to the back of my mind but when we were there I thought oh let's look into this um, and sure enough um, it, it is an active neighborhood I mean it has rat runs through it still Shepherd Cross Street there which is the thing from the bottom to the top that tends to be a rat run but how old is this how long has it been in there well, that's one of the, uh, the modal filters and some of the, um, the continuous footways. And I don't think that was put in there recently. And actually, I'd like to see the vandals try to move that one. That will be, will be interesting to see. So early in December, um, I also heard that uh, somebody at TFGM, Transport for Greater Manchester, was, was actually looking at existing modal filters, streets that have been filtered, to try and get um, interviews with the people that lived on those streets to see what their experiences were. And that sort of got me thinking about, well, I wonder how many of these there are in Bolton. We know of a few, you know, you walk around, you sort of are familiar that certain roads are blocked off to motor vehicles, but you never really know how extensive that is. Um, and so we got, um, I started, I created a Google map and uh, we started looking at Google Street View. Um, and we set up this map where, where we record, started recording where these things are. Um, we include things like ginnels and that sort of thing where it's actually been designed in. So there are different kinds of these. Uh, we also record whether it's a retrofit. Is it something that was originally designed in or was it a street that has now been blocked off to motor traffic for one reason or another? Is it cycle friendly? And unfortunately, most of them aren't. Uh, not most, and I, uh, probably the majority of them are, but, but quite a few are cycle friendly. And we also started put a, to put a Street View link into there. And we ended up with quite a lot of these. And this is looking at the, uh, the map as retrofit, retrofit versus as built. So the one with the work, worker there is, uh, is a retrofit one. The star ones are as built. And also whether they're cycle friendly, um, there's a picture of a person walking if it's not, and a, a cycle if it is. 
Um, but that's not the best way to represent this. So more recently, we pulled this into, into QGIS and, and produced a more, more detailed map. And you can see uh, now that we actually have found 911 of those across the borough. This is a borough with um, just under 300,000 people. So that's the, the size of the, of the space. Uh, retrofit ones, 343. So 343 places in the borough that were previously accessible to motor vehicles have at some point been blocked off and filtered so that only walking and cycling is, is, is possible. Um, probably about twice as many uh, walking as there are cycle friendly. And then there's a whole lot of other stuff which is uh, was built like that. Areas that were actually built with permeability for walking and cycling in mind. And some examples here, we've got uh, cycle friendly as built ones. That's what we call a ginnel in this part of the world anyway. Um, here are some, that, that may have been a street at some time, but we, we're calling that as built because uh, we're pretty sure that was built as part of the newish development that's sort of behind the camera there. Another one, which is in the middle of a, of a relatively new development. Um, this one at the bottom right, um, I think that's probably fair to say that as the stuff behind the camera is fairly new and the stuff there is quite old it's probably retrofit from the other side and as built from this side and the one in the middle there uh, on the right that probably was a farm track at one time before the housing was built in that um, that location we're going to have a look at that location in a bit more detail the as built ones well some of them are obviously it's obvious why they're not cycle friendly that's walking only and they're not pram friendly or wheelchair friendly either but that's that has a good reason. It's pretty hilly in Bolton if you go off the main roads. Uh, but quite a few of them are, um, are areas where the, there's permeability has been built into the, into the place. Um, and it's just a shame that there weren't drop curbs put in there. Um, here's another one on the le bottom left where it, what, it's, a, it's a, a path through some allotments. It's about three metres wide if you cut back the vegetation to, to, to the boundaries. Um, and unfortunately those barriers are put in so you can't get through on a bike but it's really heavily used by people walking. This one is also very annoying because um, uh, it actually is the place where you access the Bolton branch of National Cycle Route 55 and it's not cycle friendly. Uh, and the, this one amuses me a bit because they've even had to put more bollards in later to stop people driving through the field to get past which is uh, it's incredible sort of thing you see. And then looking at the retrofit ones, well, that one's very well known. That's in the center of Bolton. Anybody who's watched Peaky Blinders or any of the other things that have been filmed in Bolton will have seen that. Uh, but there are all sorts. Some are just bollards, some are continuous footways with bollards and curbs, but there they've provided a way through for, for cycles. Some are gardens and trees and plants and so on, but again, they put drop curves in and there's a drop curve on the other side, so cycles can get through as well as uh, people on foot. And some are actually whole streets that have been pedestrianized. And this is where it, it does get quite interesting. We'll come back to that a bit later. Of the walking only ones, similarly, retrofit. Um, this was a horrendous rat run. Um, which is in an area where we're currently looking at another active neighbourhood scheme. Uh, the, the consultation on that went, um, went live, I think, in the last couple of days. Uh, but that was filtered a long time ago to stop people uh, rat running to avoid a very busy junction. Um, that is actually in a, in a, in a similar location. Um, it's a different rat run, but for the same, exactly the same purpose. Here's one that I like because there's an active traveller there. If it were a bit more cycle friendly, she could actually carry a lot more shopping on a cargo bike. Again, um, these whole streets pedestrianised. And here's one that, uh, that has, um, it's gone the whole hog with trees and grass and everything. Well, that used to be a, a through route uh, to here. There is actually a route through an underpass that goes underneath the bypass into the town centre on the right there. And actually this will form part of the Bolton Town Centre East B network scheme. So we looked at these, these are just some examples, there are all sorts of, of different ones, um, but we also noticed that in lo a lot of areas there are clusters of filter permeability. So here we've got a cluster of um, as-built cases, and here if we look at these with the uh, lines on, these are mostly retrofit, and we can see that you start to see active neighbourhoods that already exist, low traffic neighbourhoods, um, if you live um, away from this area. 
Um, and so we started to look in more detail at those and, uh, and explore the areas either through Google Street Level or actually by going there and cycling and walking. And we found, I think, 18 of these or 19 of these so far distributed across the borough. So when people start arguing about low traffic neighborhoods, they're already there, they're everywhere. And some of these are really there as low traffic neighborhoods in the sense that we understand uh, now. So just looking at some of these, some of them are clearly built with active travel in mind in the first place. And there's a reason for that, which Shan will talk about uh, in a little while. Some of them are clearly retrofit. So that area there is retrofit. And this area is very interesting. Uh, but you can see that, um, that a lot of, uh, of filters are put in on the boundaries of this area. And um, what I want to do is to just look very quickly at two uh, examples of this because they're in there for seem to be in there for very different reasons. The first one is uh, what I've what we've called Castle Street Active Neighbourhood, just because Castle Street runs through the middle of it. Um, and the reason it's it's a nice quiet area to uh, to move around because of these modal filters on the boundary, and that one at the top there. Now, if you look at those, I've just taken the street that uh, I'll just go back there. If I take that that road, which is a, a very busy uh, road in the uh, in the borough. Uh, if you just turn that up, then this model filter here looks like that. And that is a street view picture from 2009. And even at that stage, these trees were starting to get mature. So that's obviously been there for quite a long time. But if we look at the two in the top there, this one, if we look at that one, that's Radcliffe Road goes across there all the way over. You can see this was actually installed in 2017, July 2017. In April 2017, it looked like that. By the following year, it looked like that. And the reason that's in there is because some work was done on this main road here, partly to try and reduce the number of uh, collisions and people getting injured on that road, which was a, a collision hotspot, uh, but also because this road was being upgraded. And um, you can see that introducing that filter there has removed some traffic movements, which would have blocked this main road. So the right turn there has been eliminated. They also made that, that road, which is also Radcliffe Road, one way. So the a right turn there has been eliminated. So that smooths the traffic flow on this main road. However, the side effect of that has been to make this a very nice area to, uh, to, to walk and cycle. It's really quiet and, and pleasant. So that's the first one. Now, this, that, and that I think is more of a sort of accidental active neighborhood because it's a result of trying to, to, uh, to improve flows on a main road. This one is a bit different. This is, uh, is near Astley Bridge, an area called Sharples. And um, that's the area. And you can see there's a mixture of as built and retrofit modal filters in there. And just looking more closely at that, we can see what that area looks like if you just remove the modal filters. Now, it's actually located between Belmont Road, which is a fairly busy main road. It was originally the route that you would take from this side of Bolton to Preston and areas over there. Um, it's to some extent been superseded by the M61, but it still is a fairly busy route. Blackburn Road is one of the busiest roads in the borough. And this junction at the bottom here on the right is uh, Astley Bridge Junction. And that is one of the most busy junctions and most congested junctions in the borough. It has dreadful figures for air quality and something needs to be done about it. Now that means there's a massive incentive for rat running between these two roads. If you've got to go down there, you'll get into the congestion uh, before you can start to get up there. So you can see where the rat runs might, might be if you didn't actually do something about it. Now, just a little bit of the, the history of this. This is really old terrace streets. This is relative, this is newer mixture of terrace streets and some um, some semi-detached sort of things a bit newer so as you move out away from the town center it's getting newer and newer and this part up in the top left is probably about 20 years old this part was there before that part so let's start to have a look at what's been done with that particular uh, set of rat runs here we've got the joint between an older estate relatively modern but older estate and the Temple Coombe estate, which is the new one. And obviously people here didn't want people who are coming into that new estate from rat running through that street. So it's been blocked off and there are two modal filters there. I'll come back to why I think there are two, 
uh, the high res engineers will probably already know why, but I have a, a theory about that. And then the other one is if even if you have to go up to Temple Coombe Drive, you can still rat run through there. But another modal filter was put in there at some time. And obviously they've had to put some uh, rubbish bins in there to stop people driving around it on the, on the footways. So that's eliminated that rat run. And if we go further down to the older streets, then you can start to see there are a lot of potential rat runs through there. Um, and one of them is this route, which would take you between the two there. And that was filtered a long time ago. These are rusty old posts and it's all overgrown now. But that was at one time a through route from here all the way through to, um, uh, to this road here. Um, that filter has been put in, just some bollards stuck in the road. That's actually a back street, but it would form um, another rat run. And in addition to that, this road here has been made one way leading away from the centre of the, of the area. And that is also one way leading away from the centre of the area. Now, it is, that, that does eliminate a through route there as well. Although residents on this street have been reporting that a lot of people actually drive the wrong way down that one way street. And then this is one that I really like. Um, this is on the main road. It's a really nice leafy uh, thing. It's again got the two modal filters, but it has drop curves, so it's accessible to, to cycles, but it also pre prevents that rat run. However, I think that one is possibly older and was put in there to stop right turns from the main road, which would have delayed traffic on this very, very busy road. So people have to go further on and follow that route round. So um, again, a mixture of, uh, of reasons for these. Okay, so, so that's um, looking at that, that second one is, is what I would really call an active neighborhood. It's really a classic rat run situation and filters have been, been put in to stop people rat running and make that a nice place for people to live. So when we look at uh, this data in QGIS, that gives us a lot of analysis potential. And I'm not gonna go into the detail of analysis, but the sorts of things we can do is put this on top of population density. We can put it on top of how many car-free households there are. Um, the brightest green in that picture are areas where 60 to 66% of households don't have access to a car or van. Um, and you can start to see some correlations and not causation necessarily, but some correlations. Uh, multiple dep deprivation index, it was mentioned earlier in Bob's talk that, um, uh, that uh, the majority of low traffic neighbourhoods are in areas where there's, where there's high def deprivation. So we can look at that sort of thing. And we can also put these on top of things like the B network proposals. This is TFGM's map of the B network. Um, so we can start to see where there might be useful routes in neighbourhoods that give access to the new routes that are being proposed. Similarly, when the Safe Streets um, uh, uh, consultations were done in uh, at the beginning of the, the first lockdown, um, first COVID lockdown, uh, we did some analysis and came up with a, a proposed set of key routes that might be useful uh, to have. Uh, and that did actually go into, uh, feed into the, um, uh, the tranche one and tranche two um, in, uh, active travel fund proposals that have gone in from Bolton. And so again, you can start to see how routes might feed into those. So that's, I've talked a bit about the, uh, about the what and some of the how. Shan has been doing a lot more digging though into the why. Why are these things here? It's quite a lot of filter permeability across the borough. So why are they there? So if Shan wants to just take over. Okay, can everyone hear me all right? Yeah, seem to be. Okay, so thanks to some photos on the Bolton Library Museum Archive. Um, these are the ones that we've identified that are general improvement areas. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Now, can I have the next slide, please, Graham? Okay, so I've got this quote because I thought it kind of summarised the policy quite well. From the Minister of Housing and Local Government, Mr Anthony Greenwood, on the 10th of February 1969. We want improvement of houses to take place more in whole areas than it has done up till now, and not just in scattered houses. The environment can make or mar the quality of life in an area and can enhance or diminish the value of the houses there. That is why we are proposing, for the first time, grants for environmental improvement. But here let me beg for a realistic outlook. We have not enough money to turn all our older areas into the hanging gardens of Babylon. At this stage, I shall simply stress how much can be achieved by providing playgrounds and open spaces with a few seats, by stopping through traffic, by improving the pavements and street furniture, and by planting trees and flower beds. 
and all for a fairly modest expenditure. Can the next slide, please? <clears throat> okay, so I thought it's kind of interesting to note with this that it's a housing policy. It, the main aim of it was to improve unfit properties. At the time, it was the main alternative was clearance of these properties, but then there was growing re resident um, opposition to that. So the environmental improvements were designed to encourage uptake of grants to improve the properties so they didn't need to be demolished and that they could have new life um, continuing into the future. The idea was to give people confidence in the future of the area and to encourage them to contribute their own money for it. For the environmental improvements, there was also a government, a central government contribution to paying for them. Um, I've kind of converted it into modern money there. Um, but also local authorities were putting their own money towards that. And next slide, please. So these are the improvements that were permitted to be spent and to be eligible for the central government contribution. So the street works is mostly what we'd be thinking of if put in place if it was an active neighbourhood today. But there's also other interventions that are about making it a nicer place to be, um, particularly the landscape and the community facilities and the sort of prettying up of the buildings. It wasn't about structural changes. It was about sort of prettying them up, really. Next step, please. Uh, next slide, please. So it's worth comparing what interventions were funded with the idea of environmental areas that was in the Buchanan report from 1963. So that's also known as traffic in towns and it was commissioned by the Ministry of Transport. Uh, you might have heard of it, but basically it was about adapting urban areas to cope with the increase in motor traffic that had already been seen and was predicted to increase even further. So in terms of traffic management, this is the main document that councils would have been working at in the time in 1969 when this policy was introduced. Um, there's, there's similarity in the interventions that we've put in in the environmental areas as there is in what in what's in the general improvement area. So the idea was balancing the place and the movement function. Um, so all the roads in the borough, there'll be some that would be allocated as to more to be towards movement. So they're the main roads that in the Buchanan report, they're not very nice to walk or cycle down. But anyway, the environmental areas were places where the place function dominated. So in this terms, we've got he quoted, an area that had a good environment in this sense would be one that, as far as traffic is concerned, is quiet, safe, clean, uncluttered by cars and safe for children. He also considered parked cars to be um, a bad thing as well because they were providing visual intrusion. When I get to the photos, you'll be able to see that we don't, we don't seem to consider that quite so much today. Uh, next slide, please. So I've got some photos after, but I'll just go through the legacy because everyone loves a photo. So, there was widespread backing and all party support for this approach. It was popular. It, it prevented the decline and deterioration of older housing. It kept communities together because the areas that were cleared, they tend to scatter the communities and people obviously didn't like that. It was also cheaper than clearance and rebuilding, always important. And so by the early 1970s, councils were doing at least as much improvement as clearance and possibly more. One of the main issues was that it was never intended to target the very worst areas. And the next housing act that was in 1974 introduced housing action areas. So they were looking at areas where the, the housing was in worse quality than what it was in these areas, but also experienced multiple deprivation on top of that. But these didn't replace the general improvement areas. They ran alongside them and also alongside clearance areas. The Originally, the idea of it was that it was just about encouraging people to take up grants and loans, but it was found that compulsory improve improvements were needed alongside this. There was a particular issue with absentee landlords who weren't willing to make improvements for their tenants. And that leads on to the next point about gentrification, especially an issue in London, but this was an issue where uh, the landlord would take a grant, use it on an unoccupied property, um, and then sell it on for a profit or raise the rent. So it was generally acknowledged that this po policy was more effective in areas where there were lots of owner occupiers. Um, the the uh, size of these areas wasn't particularly set out. There was quite a lot of freedom for councils to decide what they did and where they did it, um, but intended to be areas that were around 300 houses. So th the suggestion is that maybe this was a little bit too small to really have a big impact. The environmental areas, as I said, that's the approach that councils were wanting to take anyway. And those that did happen tended to mostly happen under general improvement areas, 
probably because of the uh, central government grants that were available, I would suggest. So between 1969 and 1973, there are about 900 general improvement areas declared in the UK. So it's quite likely that you have some in your area, particularly if you've got a lot of older housing in your area. And the environmental improvements were a very common element of them. So I've put in about resident engagement because it compares quite interestingly to with the um, active travel fund requirements. So there was community objection to clearance and that's kind of one of the reasons why this was introduced in the first place. So when the general improvement areas were introduced, there was some requirement for resident consultation, but it was more kind of after the area was declared and that they could, that they were notified and they could make representations. But at a similar kind of time, there was a general planning report in 1969 as well that was about strengthening public engagement in all matters of planning. So in some areas, the general improvement areas proved a test bed for this new approach. And it seems in those areas where they did consult meaningfully and widely, it was quite important, like in a sort of make or break terms of how successful the scheme was. So in 1973, then there was circulars issued about the importance of residents engagement in the new and upcoming general improvement areas. And it was also strengthened and required at an earlier stage when the housing action areas were introduced. And 50 years on, they, the bottom ones at least, they are mostly still there. So let's go to the next slide and you can have a look at what they're looking like. So yeah, this is an example of some paving works, uh, same spot. There's quite a lot of this red paving in the bottom ones. Um, it seems it was about providing kind of variety, visual variety, and also setting out a difference in the areas for people and the areas for cars. But if you look at the one on the left, there's still a bit of pavement car parking going on even in the 70s. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, there we've got a road closed to motor traffic and this is off the archive we can see before and after in the same spot and there's the kids playing and there's a lovely little video um there's more kids playing in the video uh, next slide please so these two show where it was um maybe a back alleyway or something but it was originally a road completely all the way through that's been closed off to motor traffic and on the one on the left you can see it looks like it maybe used to be trees that were doing the closing off, but it's bollards now. Um, but you can see how the red paving continues across the road. And when I went for a walk down that, it did, I did actually get a car given way to me across there. So I thought that was quite good. And then in the right, it looks like it, there's ornamental paving there. So it looks like it's been refreshed kind of a bit more recently. Next slide, please. Um, so parking blocks were something that was introduced as well under this. So on the left, you've got garages, but then on the right, you can see that the garages have gone, the house has gone, and it's been replaced by a flatbed car park um, for residents, but there's still people parking on the street. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so tree and shrub planting, um, there you can see on the left when they've just been put in, and they had new street lights as well. There's new, new street lights now, but the uh, trees and shrubs, a lot of them still there. Next slide, please. Oh yeah, and I like this one. This was out of the Bolton News um, about Mrs. Thorpe, who no longer has to look at flagstones, park cars and litter, and she can tend the flowers outside her house, which is very nice. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so there's some more tree and shrub planting. Um, same spot again. On the right, it looks like someone's removed one of the bollards uh, to let them park right in front of the house. Um, but again, mostly still there. Next slide, please. So the ones in bottom, they tend to, there are still some through routes through them. So they tend to do it by putting in one way systems so that it's the long straight roads where people can pick up traffic. They're not there so much. So in the left hand one, you can see a planter there blocking off what would have been a straight on route. So people have to turn left. And then on the right, the trees, I quite like these because this is quite a long straight street, but you can see that the trees are partially planted in the road, so um, it slows the traffic speed. Uh, next slide, please. And there's some play areas as well, which is nice. Old, still there in the new photo. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so um, some conclusions, we'll not, uh, not dwell on these, but I think it's worth picking out a, a couple of things. One is that the fairness objections about moving traffic onto um, close onto main roads, boundary roads, that is sometimes true, but actually 
uh, it also often isn't true and in fact often the opposite is the case because uh, filtering side streets actually makes flows um, on main roads simpler and um, and probably smoother gentrifications well that can be studied because it's been uh, it's been um, experienced before and it's worth looking at how the politics have changed since then we've got valuable information for our b network planning so uh, we might want to look back at, um, at some of that and it's also possible to study um, uh, the the various impacts of, of these schemes uh, just looking back we don't have to wait for them to be put in and then and then investigate them we can actually look back Okay, so I just want to go back to that um, that quotation that I, I put up at the beginning. That was actually from Colin Buchanan in the uh, Traffic in Towns uh, report in 1963. So this stuff's been known about for a long time. Now in 1963, I had my sixth birthday. Uh, the Beatles hit the big time with their first three number one hits. The Beeching Report was published, which started decimating the railways and helped to bake car dependence into our whole culture. And Colin Buchanan in that year wrote this about the motor car. Given its head, it would wreck our towns within a decade. The problems of traffic are crowding in upon us with desperate urgency. Unless steps are taken, the motor vehicle will defeat its own utility and bring about a disastrous degradation of the surroundings for living. Either the utility of vehicles in town will decline rapidly or the pleasantness and safety of surroundings will deteriorate catastrophically. In all probability, both will happen. So we'll leave you with that. I forgot to come in then because I was enjoying the talk so much. Uh, I think that was probably uh, my favorite talk that we've had so far on Ideas with Beers, Graham and Sean. That was, uh, that was amazing and I was I just gonna often show my copy of traffic in towns <laughs> so, yeah like uh, so you've uh, you've raveled where we got all the ideas from and you know there's nothing new under the sun so i'll, I'll open it up for questions and comments uh, i thought that was fantastic well done any anybody got any i'll look at the participants to see if there's any hands up any any questions or comments on that uh, i will say i remember talking to kirsty and and, and, and Chris Boardman would like, and we're saying, well, wouldn't it be nice to go to one of these that's already there and ask the people, what would you say if we pulled that out? I just kind of started from that conversation and, and Graham, you've absolutely run and run with it and, and given us a, amazing data. And I've been having like a, a like a, a battle with, um, with Vincent Stops over who's got the most filters and, and Bolton's come from nowhere to, to, I think, take the title. So uh, yeah, no, amazing work. Um, any, any, oh, uh, Megan, do you want to come in? I can see some hands now. Hi, sorry, I'm, I'm cooking dinner. Um, <laughs> I, I was going to ask about Bolton. Obviously, there's loads of examples, and now that they've been kind of identified on this map, has that actually made a difference in terms of how people are thinking about active neighborhoods and modal filters, or, or is it kind of still too early? Well, it's still too early. Surprisingly, this we're about six weeks into this work. It was the beginning of December when uh, when when we first created the map. So it's 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 it seems like like months to us, but it's actually quite quite new. Yeah, certainly that's the plan, though, that we can use this to say, look, there's nothing new. And I used to start talks with a Lowry picture showing a, a modal filter on it and go, yeah, like that. So it's great to see so many of them. I'll just jump in on that one. Um, Tim, do you want to come in? Let's yeah, that was absolutely brilliant. Really enjoyed that presentation. Thank you. Um, I, my background is social housing and in particular unpopular housing estates and a lot of um, issues with joy riding and so on. So all those um, blockages on uh, footpaths and ginnels uh, are, the, are there to stop the motorbikes or the, the joyriding cars initially. So it's probably worth looking back at um, reports around <clears throat> the bigger social housing estates where there have been issues in the past around antisocial behaviour. The, the general improvement areas, um, that's where I came in in Leicester with housing action areas and um, Leicester's Sustrans group are doing exactly what you've been doing. They're going around and trying to identify these former areas and go, hey, look, we've already got this. Um, my experience of trying to go and pick up a friend in a car from one of those areas 
is it's completely rammed with cars now. You cannot move for, for cars. So um, the, uh, the, they're not moving any of the cars, they're all parked, but it is a real squeeze to get through. Um, they've forgotten why it was designed like that. I'll shut up. Do you have a similar thing to that in Bolton, Graham? Yeah, there are. There is. I mean, a lot of these places, when you go around them now, they've got a lot of parked cars. And particularly in the first one that I mentioned, which sort of sort of kicked off this this work, um, the uh, most of the work that's been done is continuous footways that aren't blocked off. You're actually allowed to drive on them. And so you get a lot of cars parked in them. Um, however, that, there have been, there's at least one place that, uh, that, that I, I went riding around and I noticed there's actually a, a bunch of fairly new stainless steel bollards been put across a pedestrianised street to stop people driving down it. So, so it looks as though there have been some attempts to, um, to recover the, uh, what was there before. Brilliant. Um, we might start winding up now, but I'm, I'm having a conversation in Bury about the emergency theatre travel fund when we talk about filter. And they were like, what's that? And I, and I showed an area, they had died, and I said, you're missing the 10th one. And uh, I think we've got that across Bolton now. So uh, you know, big thanks again. I'll, uh, we'll go over to Roof now, I think, because we've passed our time to, to give us some final thoughts, but, but fantastic work again. Hi, everybody. Um, a quote from uh, one of the regent recent engagement exercises for street, street space in Hounslow. Is it all as we know, cycling is a hobby for a lovely Sunday morning, not a practical way of life. Um, unfortunately, that's how people still perceive cycling in spite of um, everything that we're doing. And I have to say last year, I didn't say this, but I did 5,000 miles even at my great age in one year and I'm not a touring cyclist or anything. Um, I just want to actually do a thank you to all of you who are working in the industry because Hounslow have run four street space engagement events in the last two or three weeks and the abuse they are getting is shocking. It's absolutely disgraceful. No one should speak to other people like that. It's shameful beyond belief and um, not enough of the people who are for these schemes will go on these things because they don't like the language. Um, but I just wanted you to know that there's an awful lot of us behind the scenes who really, really appreciate every single thing that you're doing. And I think we should do an applause to all of you. Thank you, that's my last word. Well, okay, that's the last word, let's, uh, let's wind up. I know there was a few people that wanted to, to come in, but the last words have been spoken, people. We've got to wait till next week. Sound good? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Great session, everybody. Fantastic. See you all next week. We've got some great speakers lined up as well.